Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Hi, this is Leo Laporte, and this is my Tech Guy podcast. Yes, this show originally aired on the Premier Network's 200 stations all over the country on Sunday, April 21st, 2019. This is episode 1585. Enjoy. Hey, hey, hey. Happy Easter Day, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Time to talk tech, computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography, smartphones, smart watches, Harry Potter United. That's the new game. And all that jazz, 8888-ASK-LEO. That's the phone number if you want to talk high tech with me. I'd, I'd love to hear from you. 888-827-5536. That's toll-free from anywhere in the U.S. or Canada. Uh, you can still call it, of course, with Skype out or something like that if you're anywhere else in the world. And we have listeners all over the world, which I love. I'm thrilled about, thanks to the miracle of the Internet. Happy Passover uh, as well to uh, those. And I know Dr. Mom, she said she had matzo brai for breakfast, so I know. I know she celebrated. Um, and, of course, happy release of the Galaxy Fold week. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> uh, I, feel, I, I, I can't help but feel bad for, uh, for Samsung. I'm, I, I just don't know. I mean, first you have the exploding phone, the Note 8, and then uh, now this. <laughs> The uh, exploding fold, I guess we could call it. Samsung um, seeded uh, some of the uh, tech reviewers with early release versions of this folding phone. I mean, I think it's, you know, a really interesting idea. It's bulky. It's thick. It's like it's almost like if you took two normal Samsung, you know, big Samsung phones and made a sandwich out of them. On the front of one of them is a thin, uh, sm relatively small screen. Relatively. I mean, it's bigger than iPhone 4S, but a relatively small screen on the front. And then when you open it up, whatever you're doing on that screen, looking at a map or reading a website, you open it up and you've got uh, the inside is this giant, relatively giant, you know, maybe almost seven inch screen. And, uh, and you know, I thought that was pretty cool. In fact, the initial reaction of reviewers to this was, wow, I get it. I get it. I see it's not just a gimmick. I see why uh, this is, you know, something that somebody would want. This makes a lot of sense. This is a really cool idea. And then, um, well, then it's easy. the other side happened. The uh, well, some of the reviewers. In fact, I think the majority of reviewers did something that it said in the uh, in the material they received not to do. But I guess you know nobody reads manuals, even tech reviewers. Although really we should, right? Uh, it said, uh, according to Samsung, pretty clearly, do not peel the protective plastic layer off the screen. It could damage it, and don't put any adhesives on the screen. It could damage it. So at least several of them did that. And you know what? The phone. <laughs> Thank you. The the phone broke. It broke. Some of the other reviewers uh, didn't do anything, and the phone broke. <laughs> um, Samsung's rushing replacements out to those reviewers. Nevertheless, um, it's kind of. You know, one would be maybe not great, but at least, you know, you could say, well, that was a bad one. But uh, I think the last count was four or five. That's pretty bad. It, within two days, that's pretty bad. And it makes me think, <laughs> well, twice about buying the phone. It's going to be available in the United States, the Galaxy Fold, uh, at, I think, T-Mobile and AT&T on the 25th. If you pre-ordered it, you're probably going, oh, no. On the 26th, you'll get it. Oh, no. But, you know, and at first, in fact, I even said this yesterday. I, I guess I won't buy it because uh, it is a $2,000 phone. I guess I won't get it. You know, I'll wait till they figure this out. But then I realized, no, it's my duty. It's my duty to get this phone, to go buy it. And see, I prefer to do that than to get it. First of all, they didn't send me one. 
But even then, I don't, I, I don't like that. I, I could have arranged to get one for review, but I don't like that idea because uh, I want to review the product people are buying in the stores. And you can see the benefit of my, <laughs> of my opinion uh, today because I don't have a broken one in front of me. I don't have anything in front of me. But I think I'm going to go. I think I think I am going to go to the T-Mobile store on Thursday and, and pick one up. Because, you know, if it breaks, I'm sure I can get my money back. Right? So if it breaks. But and then I think I owe it to you to, to, I mean, certainly I wouldn't tell you to get it. But I owe it to you to see if this thing breaks, you know, every single time. I won't peel off the protective layer. Apparently, Samsung on the production versions of this phone has a pretty big warning on the box. Do not, do not. But um, I think we, I think we ought to take a look at it. Two thousand dollars later, I think we ought to take a look at it. Yeah, I buy. As somebody in the chat room is saying, I buy bad phones so you don't have to. But I see. I'm not sure it is bad. I want to make you know. Maybe they just. Maybe there were some bad units out there. Maybe the reviewers, you know, uh, uh, were unnecessarily hard. I don't know. I don't plan to baby the phone. We 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 shall see. Because I think, well, I guess here I'll give you the ground of being. I did buy and uh, am using as my daily driver now. I uh, I I put aside my iPhone. 10s max and i've been using the samsung galaxy s10 plus since it came out and i just i'm i just love it i think samsung is has improved the user interface this new samsung one ui i think it's a really nice android device i currently fit my favorite android device and defect free i might add <laughs> it has it hasn't broken so I'm, I kind of want to see what Samsung's done with this Fold. Because I do think folding phones are going to be, if they can make them work, and we always were a little worried about the fact, you know, when you fold, the, the thing that folds is the screen. It is a, it is a computer screen that folds in half. And, I, you know, everyone was wondering, well, how, you know, how many times before it gets a crease? Can you see a visible crease in it now, now right? Can, what, what does it look like? And how well would it hold up? I have to think it's going to last more than two days. Otherwise, surely Samsung would have uncovered that in their testing. <laughs> uh, we'll find out. Anyway, so I think by next weekend I will have one for you. And, um, and either I will join the troop of people who sadly returns their phones or I will give you a real review of it and, and, and its utility. Because I'm thinking, you know... We have laptops, we have desktops, we have big screen computers, and we have little screen computers in our pocket. But wouldn't it be nice if there were something in the middle, a little screen computer that could turn into a medium size screen that we could use for reading and writing email and you know just a better experience, better gaming? Wouldn't that? I think it's a sensible theory. We talk on the show a lot about ransomware. Now uh, we're learning that the Weather Channel went down April 18th, three days ago, for 90 minutes due to ransomware. During the 90 minutes, the Weather Channel IT staff restored impacted computers from backups. Yay, they had backups. <laughs> what a brilliant thought. <laughs> but the entire process took 90 minutes. Well, okay, that you know, there's a lot of computers. they got to restore them all, make sure that that malware is nowhere to be found on the network. In fact, I'm impressed they were able to do it in 90 minutes. And the, and, and the Weather Channel went back on. It's unfortunate that it was, it was happening during a uh, massive storm. Um, you know, it was kind of bad timing. And it, is, uh, it underscores the, um, the, the uh, thing I always tell you about. Ransomware, malware in general, uh, you know, I'm sure we don't know yet how it got into the network, but it's almost certain that it was from a phishing attack. Almost all, the vast majority, 70 or 80 percent of all malware infections come from an email that somebody at the network received, probably a targeted email. And uh, it looked so reasonable, it came from the boss and looked so reasonable that they just said, oh, and they opened it. And then they were on the company network or maybe they were at home, but then they brought their computer into the company network and the company network got infected. It is possible to prevent that. <laughs> and I'm sure the Weather Channel and other companies are doing what they can. It just keeps happening, doesn't it? 
it is possible to protect yourself, I believe, against that. That there are things that you can do to make sure that, you know, you don't get bit by this stuff. <sighs> Nevertheless, it keeps happening. All right, we're going to take a little break. Go to the phones. I'm ready for your calls. 8888-ASK-LEO. The website is techguylabs.com. It's the official theme song for the wonderful Kimmy Schaeffer. She's unbreakable. <laughs> Hello. We, we borrowed that, I confess, from the very, very good. Yeah, when are we going to get that cease and desist letter? <laughs> yeah, no, no, we pay license fees. We pay ask at BMI license fees. I think that's okay. Uh, Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt, which is on, uh, what is Netflix. it on? Netflix. Netflix? Yep. Oh, you, it's a great show. It is a great show. I need to go back to it. <laughs> yeah. So we, we borrowed their theme song, which is a great theme song for the purposes of this program looking we've been looking for a long time so it turns out we were talking about the breaking phones now the, the verge the, an unbreakable <laughs> fold turns out the verge made a little uh, slight admission today they said well so remember the verge didn't remove the plastic mm -hmm. but uh Dieter bone had when he closed his phone at one point something un it got had gotten in the hinge and bulged up the uh the screen get damaging it permanently. And then they, they admitted today, well, in the photo shoot, as we always do, we put a little mold, little mold, little molding putty behind it to hold it up. And maybe that got into the hinge and caused the problem. Hmm. Now, there's two ways to look at that. One is, oh, the other is. Still, it shouldn't break. It should. Well, <laughs> it will. It will indicate. So you know, you got to keep that uh, hinge clear. Yeah. And not, you know, put any molding putty on the hinge. Um, anyway, I decided uh, yesterday. Remember, we talked, and I said, said "Ah, I yeah, I'm not, not going to do it." it. I, will I decided. Do it. I I owe it to everybody to get it. Oh no! I know it's really? two thousand dollars. Well, because I got to <laughs> see. Well, look, if it go if it breaks, I can get the money back, right? You know, I can I, return it. Well, I guess if it happens within fourteen days. <laughs> No, they have a longer warranty than oh, that. Okay. So I get them. I'm not too worried about that. I'll get it. And I think I would recommend this from a local T-Mobile store or, mm -hmm. you know, AT&T, wherever you get it. Get it from your local phone store because then they will stand by it. You can yeah. bring it in and say, look what happened. And I think most people, uh, you know, if something goes wrong, they're going to say, yeah, well, we saw all those reviews. So, okay. I bet you Samsung's going to have a pretty liberal gonna, return policy. Do you think they're going to have a run on them, or do you think this is going to no. deter people? Well, from that's it? the sad thing. This is a lot, a lot like the exploding note, yeah. right? Yeah. This is uh, this is a, another dark black mark on Samsung, and I feel bad for them. They are the number one manufacturer of of smartphones in the world, uh, easily beating Apple, which is number two or three, depending on uh, the time of year. Um, in the United States, it's about 50-50 Android, Apple. But the That's rest of the world, Android is a big winner. Apple is more here in the U.S. Yeah, it's more I, America. I, when I've been in America. other countries, I, I noticed they have other Android. kinds of phones. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, most of the Android phones are cheaper phones. Most of the Samsung phones sold are cheaper phones. Mm -hmm. um, but, I, you know, I am very impressed, as I said, with the S10. I think it's a great phone. It's my uh, I've liked I've had every note ever made. I've ever had ever 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 had ever 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 every every Galaxy S phone ever okay, made. Elmer. <laughs> Elmer. <laughs> they're the they're the, 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 the great phones. So, oh Porky, sorry, wrong. <laughs> Elmer Porky, <laughs> call me whatever you want, Kimmy. Who should I talk to? Well, I think Doctor Mom. Uh, just you know, she's our resident expert. So always new information on. Yeah. Remember, we don't say a, oh, the, the A word. A word. Yeah. We say the echo word. Our resident Amazon. You know why we do it? Because Dr. Mom yelled at me. Oh, you know what? She, she was telling me about it and hers was going off in the background. Yeah, she yelled at me <laughs> when I said it on the radio. She said, you just bought a dollhouse. I don't want or whatever. <laughs> well, at least it was a dollhouse and not something worse. That's the story, actually, that the, some somebody's kid figured out how to order stuff with the Amazon Echo and all of this stuff, including a dollhouse and a lot of candy, started arriving in the house. They couldn't figure out why, and then they finally figured it out. Oh, little Sally has figured out how to order through the Amazon Echo. Reminds no. me of the, the kid who called 911 because he wanted McDonald's the other night. Did you hear that story? <laughs> it was quite cute. <laughs> There's something wrong with our children. Thank you, Kim Schaffer. 911, Dr. The Mom. unbreakable Kimmy Schaffer. 
Hello, Dr. Mom. Are you uh, are you still in New York or have you moved to sunny California yet? If you saw my house right now, Leo, it looks like a rummage sale at the Salvation Army. <laughs> there are boxes everywhere. You're encountering something. You're on the leading edge of, uh, of users that are encountering something new. And it is the IOT, the moving the IOT problem. If you've got a house that's got a lot of Internet of Things devices, some of which you'll be leaving, some of which you'll be taking, it is it, it, it is it is complicated to shut it all down and pack it up and move it. Well, part of it, some of the things I'm not going to take, I installed some Z-Wave switches. I'm not going to start pulling them right. out of the wall. Right. The light bulbs, I'm going to... The biggest thing I found out for people who use the small... You know, most of these things you need to use a hub. I was hoping I could because I use a smart things hub, I could leave the old hub behind, just disconnect it from my account, and whoever buys the house could just register the hub. That's logical. Nope, nope doesn't work that way. They have to uh, uh, remove, exclude every single Z-Wave. One device, by one. New, <laughs> one by one, set up a new account, oh, put man. the hub back on, and then re-include everything. So I knew this because uh, a colleague of mine, Stacy Higginbotham, who, who is an IoT expert, in fact, she has a website called StacyOnIoT.com. She wrote a whole article on this issue. She's also selling her house and moving, and she has a lot of built-in stuff. And that's the real issue. I mean, it's not a big deal if you're taking your Echo with you. You just pack it up and take it with you. You might have to, you know, change some things when you get there. But, boy, it's a big deal for the stuff that's built into the house. You don't want the new owners to be using your account. No, of course not. And I mean, the things I'm, I'm taking, the light bulbs, I'm taking the motion detectors I have stuck up with tape everywhere that I used to control the lights and such. It's good uh, you didn't screw those into the walls because then the, the new buyer keeps them, right? It's yeah. <laughs> and then taking all the Sonoses, all yeah. the... A word devices. Yeah, it's a nut. It's a mess. It's this is a whole new thing nobody's ever thought of before. It's it like I said, it was so convenient if I could just disconnect the hub from my account and tell whoever buys the place just lo register it and you've immediately got control of all the switches and stuff. But that doesn't work. Doctor Mom, can you hang on for a bit? We've got our car guy Sam Abul Samid coming up, and I would like to talk to you about new. Echo features. So hang on. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hello, Sam. Hello, Leo. Welcome back. I am. I got to tell you, we drove, we got a rental car in Hawaii, drove around Kauai, and it had Android Auto and Apple, uh, Apple's uh, CarPlay. And I'd never really used it before. I was really impressed with CarPlay, less so with Android Auto, I thought. But CarPlay was great. I plugged in the iPhone. Fortunately, I carry both. <laughs> plugged what, in. What didn't you like about Android Auto? Well, maybe I, I, you know, I should spend more time configuring it. But the nice thing about CarPlay, it immediately comes up with a screen that kind of looks like an iPhone. Mm -hmm. It recognized all the apps that I have that are CarPlay compatible, including uh, my Twit, which is one of our podcast uh, apps. So I was able to immediately listen to all uh, of the Twit podcasts on uh, CarPlay. Android Auto. It put a clock up and a button that said home. It didn't really seem to do a lot uh, of the stuff. I thought the, the, the yeah, well, Apple was much more the, intuitive. There's, the, there's the menu bar along the bottom of the screen in Android Auto that you can tap to go to your map apps, your your yeah. uh, communication apps, and, and your media apps. And if you tap on the media apps, you, know, you can select from... Whatever podcast too many taps. To to or, <laughs> too many yeah. taps. Well, if if you if you were already listening to something like, for example, you know, I listen. No, to my that would podcast, come up. Yeah, my the music keeps yeah, coming it'll, up. It'll show up yeah. as a, as one of those widgets on that home screen. Not as pretty, I thought, as CarPlay, but you know, I could spend some more time with it and maybe give it a better chance. You know, as a as a Tesla owner, I don't get either. I have Tesla's own UI. Uh, you know, and Tesla's very uh, like Apple, very opinionated about what stuff should how it should work and so forth. You're driving today. You're driving what? An edge? Yeah, I got back from uh, Claps Shapes String uh, and picked up a, a 2019 <laughs> Ford Edge. <laughs> Claps uh, Shapes String. Yes, that that is uh, one. That is the entry door that we used to get into the Jacob J. Javits Center in New York this week for the New York oh, Auto that's Show. Hysterical. <laughs> and uh, that is the the what three words code uh, for that particular entrance that we used uh, to get in. Uh, so. Uh, about a month or so ago, we talked about what three words um, when Ford announced that they were adding support to that uh, to their vehicles through their their Sync AppLink platform. So, do and you so say navigate to, 
yeah. low walnut nasal, and it will then automatically just put it up on the map properly? Yeah, um, that's exactly what you do. You can either tap the, the voice button on the steering wheel, or if you have the what three words uh, screen up, you know, on the on the screen, you can tap voice entry there and, and just say, uh, in fact, you if you're in the if you have the what three words app, you don't even have to say navigate to it'll just prompt you to just say the words uh, like glow walnut nasal or clap shaped string or whatever else. Uh, and as we talked about before, of course, you have to remember those three words for the destination you want to go to. Uh, but having used it now, one of the things that they offer in there. Um, in the in the app, you can go in and you can save particular destinations uh, to your favorites. And uh, so on the screen, when you bring up what three words, there's a, a button for saved and it'll show you a list of all the the, play, the destinations you've saved. So you don't have to remember the codes, uh, at least sort of not because. But why not just say the, ba you know, Jacob Javits Center? You know that you remember that. Well, yes, that that's that's true. Um, if, if you want, but what that'll typically do is take you. It, it'll generally it'll take you to one particular entry. Yeah. So if you if you're trying to meet somebody or if you're waiting for uh, a Lyft or an Uber to come pick you up, unfortunately they don't they haven't implemented this yet. But when they do, that'll that'll be a good thing because now you can give them a, a you know a ten foot square desk, you know, more specific, more precise location to pick you up at because, you know, the Javits Center or, you know, any stadium or things like that, they typically have multiple entrances. And so this lets you, you know, get a much more precise location. Cool. How do you like the edge? Uh, the edge is great. Um, you know, it's a, it's a nice midsize crossover. Um, you know, it, this particular one, you know, they don't have, uh, you know, any electrification options on this one yet. The next generation one will. Uh, but at the, uh, at the uh, auto show, um, Lincoln showed off its new Corsair, which is their new compact crossover. That we saw a whole bunch of different things there, and uh, everything's moving towards adding either hybrid, plug-in hybrid, or for full battery electric options. Yeah, that's what is exciting to me. I don't ever want to have to buy another gas car. And now, because there's charging stations everywhere, I feel like we're really making progress. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Although, we're, as we've talked about before, we're buying a uh, a car. You know, my our son is 16 and, uh, he, you know, he's going to get his driver's license. And we're thinking the next car we get is going to be end up inheriting his car when he goes off to college. And that made me think twice, because when he goes off to college, there may not be a place to charge when he rent, you know, rents a, uh, a house. There may not be a place to charge if he's living in an apartment. There may not be a place to charge an electric car might not be the most practical. So now we're thinking maybe hybrid. Yeah, or or a plug-in hybrid, you know, is another option. Uh, you know, that way, when you when you have a place to charge, you can plug it in. Uh, you know, in case like something like the Nero, you got about 27 miles of electric range, uh, so you can do a lot of your daily driving on electricity. And then, you know, when when you when you run out the battery, then you can just keep on driving, uh, just like a regular hybrid. So that's also an option. I noticed Ford is putting a new uh, something they call the Copilot 360 technology. Mm -hmm. These are driver assist technologies. Can you tell me a little bit about that? That's in their yeah. newer cars. Yeah. So, so Copilot 360 is Ford's branding for their uh, their driver assist package. They're what we call advanced driver assist systems or ADAS. Uh, and on all their vehicles now, they're making the basic Copilot 360 is standard equipment. And a lot of manufacturers are doing this. Honda I like that because this used to be vehicle. a real premium thing to buy the driver assist right. stuff. But it's so important for safety. It really does uh, help with safety that oh, I, it, it I feel like it should does. be standard equipment. Yeah. Especially things like, um, lane keeping assist and automatic emergency braking, um, you know, and, and pedestrian detection. And that's part of what Ford has in its co-pilot 360, uh, Toyota, Honda, a lot of other manufacturers are making that standard across their mainstream Ford lineup. Ford was very early with that bliss system. I think they got it from mm -hmm. Volvo. They're yeah. Volvo, Volvo originally created it. Um, that uses a pair of radar sensors in the rear corners uh, to detect if there's vehicles in your blind spot. So if you're uh, if you're going to change lanes, if there's something, if there's another vehicle in the in that co in that corner area where you might not see it in your mirrors, it'll give you an alert uh, before you change lanes. I love and that. Also, That's one of the most dangerous things you do on the highway. It is the most dangerous yeah. thing you do is changing lanes. Right. And actually, one of, one of the the most useful things that they've since it originally came out about. 12, 13 years ago, the thing that they've added to that is uh, cross traffic alert. So when you're in a parking lot at the store and you're going to back out, you know, say you're sitting between a couple of SUVs or a couple of trucks and you can't see if there's somebody coming down the aisle, 
those radar sensors, because they're at the rear corners, the oh, bumpers, the that's rear huge. bumpers, they can actually look down the aisle in either direction and give you an alert if there's somebody coming, you know, even before you would be able to see it. Uh, so that that's a really valuable tool, I think, that, that they offer in there. And it's great to see them start to offer those as basic features in in all their vehicles i'd love to see yeah more. and i i think i think every manufacturer should be doing this on on every model and it, increasingly it's moving in that direction europe um they have the uh, the euro uh, european new car assessment program euro ncap which is their their crash test program we have a similar one here in the, mm -hmm. in the u.s um and in order to get a five-star rating going forwards on the euro ncap manufacturers are going to have to include uh, automatic emergency braking and some of these other driver assists as standard equipment. So that's why everybody's moving in that direction. And the cost of the sensors and the computers has come down so much for that stuff that it's you know it, it doesn't cost them that much to add that capability, and it greatly reduces your odds of getting into uh, rear end collisions. Sam Abul Semid, principal researcher at Navigant Research. He's our car guy. He's a guy I go to when I want to know more about the new technology in the vehicles. Thank you, Sam. My pleasure, Leo. 8888 Ask Leo. Dr. Mom is on hold. We're going to go back to her in just a second and talk about Amazon Echo. Stay right here. Dr. Mom, thank you for being a very patient doctor. Well, that's confusing. A uh, doctor with patience. That's even more confusing. So, <laughs> no, no problem, Leo. <laughs> thank you for hanging on. So uh, what, what do you want to talk about? Well, a couple of things are coming up. Uh, no new hardware really coming out from Amazon right now. Uh, I still can't get my hand on an on an Echo Auto. There's, you know, it's like we have your requests, we're filling them. Yeah, are they really though? I've never seen anybody with one. So I'm, <clears throat> I know they announced it months people, ago. There's people are selling them on eBay. So I think some people got. Oh, okay, them. okay. But I think part of it is I don't remember the clock had a Bluetooth issue. Yeah. Remember that? Yeah. You got the clock, right? Did you send it back? Did they take it back? What happened? I had it fail, and I called them up, and they said, okay, don't even try anything. We're <laughs> sending you a new one. And they sent me the new one. And you can keep the old one just as a memento of our... No, they want the old one back. Oh, they do? Oh, okay. <laughs> they probably do quality issues. Yeah, uh, checks on Yeah, because honestly, I don't think they're going to do anything with it. But yeah, they probably want to see what, what failed. Yeah. So there is a new device for Google Home users, though. We talked about it yesterday with the Gizwiz. The folks uh, at Roav, uh, Rove who did the um, Vivo, which was an echo for your car that fit into the cigarette lighter, have now a Google Home version. The, uh, what do they call it? The tube? The, I don't the remember bowl? off the top of the my head. I, I was running between <laughs> Seder's uh, when yeah. you guys were doing it yesterday. Yeah. Oh, you get more than one? Two nights, remember? <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. Uh, by the way, if you go to roav.com, you get everything you want to know about cannabis. So that's not where I'm, <laughs> where I'm going to recommend you go. I can't remember. Uh, anyway, it's uh, it's from the folks at Anchor, so I'm going to Google Anchor Roav. Yeah. But that I don't, uh, you know, I you got the Vivo too. I think I never really. It's go roav.com. It's the Roav Bolt. Um, you I, you got the Vivo too, and I, I I took mine out after a while. I just didn't find it that useful. Well, for me, <laughs> most of what I'm listening to, if I was going to use the Amazon device, would be things like Audible and such. It's just as easy to jack my phone in, yeah, and stream it off. The That's phone. what I think, and I I didn't really need my Echo in my car. Maybe the home I'd be more useful, but I, I didn't really see the point of it. Well, the home I got them in every room in the house. Yeah, so, so. oh, that's interesting. Despite your love for the Amazon Echo. You have oh, Google no, no. devices there too. Yeah, of course you got to. I've got to try them both. I'll tell you, I think the Echo makes a better intercom. Inter yeah, that's what they were the first to announce that feature. Right, and that's that's useful. I mean, the new place where it's all one level, and it will save me yelling down the hall to yep. tell my husband dinner's ready. Yep. It's just to be able to do the announcement. We tried it, but our sixteen-year-old immediately disconnected it. <laughs> <laughs> you mean off the, off the Billy the Big Mouth bath? Yeah, yeah, he didn't want he didn't want me to be able to say, Michael, it's time for dinner. Wash your hands in his bedroom with that loud voice. He prefer I shout down the hall. Well, so, of course. What yeah, is? yeah, it's easier to ignore. I can't hear you. I got my headphones on. Well, then that's when you sit there and you go on your mesh thing and you turn off his Wi-Fi. Yes, I have discovered that trick as well. <laughs> yeah. What happened to the Wi-Fi? It's not working. Yeah. 
couple of things have, however, that Amazon's announced while you were gone and then I was gone. One, you know the flash briefings? Yeah. I know because we put now, everything we do gets turned into a flash briefing. What? What happened? Well, you might look, but you now have long you now have longer news briefings. They're oh. not calling them flash flash briefings anymore, but you can sit there and say, "What's the news?" CNN. What's the news? Oh, nice. And you're going to get a much longer report. Oh, that's nice. So you can actually get a newscast instead of just a quick little hit. Exactly. So, so this is one of the problems I have with all these devices. Uh, you know, you get the email, I get the email, but you read it, I just ends up in my trash. It's a lot of work to keep up with what these things can do. Right. So, well, this is so good. This is why we have you, Dr. Mom. That's what, now, the next one to me as a physician is more interesting. Amazon so signed the HIPAA Small Business Agreement. Oh, interesting. Now, how did, what does that mean? A HIPAA Small Business Agreement means a company is willing to sign agreements that they ha will provide end-to-end -end encryption on communications, that they will not pry into what's going on. So in other words, now if somebody develops a medical app for the Amazon device, Amazon is not going to use it to say, whoops, well, you're talking to the obstetrician. Maybe we should put up on your page, would you like to buy diapers? They have to stay totally out of it. Thank you. Secure the record. Boy, you would have thought that was the way it was originally. Oh, really? <sighs> Golly. Oh, you had a baby. Congratulations. That's none of your business. But so I'll tell you what I see this coming as for the price of them. I can see them turning this into the hospital intercom oh. and the home intercoms. Oh. But, you know, between you and your doctor or your nurse that you can sit there and communicate with them. That's actually a great idea. So I'm at home. I'm bedridden. Uh, I have a nurse, but if she's not there all the time, the ability to use the intercom to ask for help or, yeah, that's a really good idea. Exactly. I really and like that. With idea. that small business agreement, it means that it's compliant. Now, people need to realize no phone company has ever signed that agreement. This is the I first time. Hasn't signed it. Oh, interesting. Um, I, good I, on Amazon then. Yeah, I don't think Am Google or uh, Apple have, they have some medical things, but right now they're all, you know, being tested and rolled out. Yeah. But to be able to use them, they've got, um, they've got to sign that agreement and. Cause a hospital, so a hospital, a healthcare giver can't even put one of these devices in without that HIPAA agreement. Well, it's amazing what's considered protected. Believe it or not, your weight is protected information. As it should be. <laughs> your eye color, anything that could. Uh, I did. I did used to have a. <clears throat> I did that, used to have an internet connected scale that would tweet my weight every time I weighed myself. I turned that thing off. Well, that's different. You can do what you want. I can do what I want. That's right. <laughs> but I want the doctor doing it. Doctor. Yeah. Well, yeah. And you know, you can see the real concern that a doctor might be feeding that information to, for instance, your insurance company. That wouldn't be a good well, thing. It's not, it's not even that. It's, let's say, that Company Z, who provides, you know, is your provider, is listening in on it and says, oh, this person has hepatitis. Maybe yeah. we should sell them ads, you know, right. for this one. Or worse, and, and I've heard this as a scenario, well, this person is sounding a little bit manic. Uh, we know that that often means uh, kind of shopaholicism. Let's start feeding them a lot of ads because they're likely to buy a lot of stuff right now. Absolutely. That would be worse. And I'm sure that at least our good friends at Facebook would do that if they could. Well, they haven't signed the agreement. <laughs> They'll really? never sign the agreement. In fact, I'd be shocked if, if Google does, too. I, I just feel like this yeah. information is so valuable to them. And until you mention this on the show, I don't think anybody even knew such a thing existed. So it's easy yeah. not to do it, right? Because no one even knows you could. Right, but doctors have always known that's been part of it, which is why when I would communicate with another physician, I had to make a phone call. Right. Text messages are not hip are not HIPAA compliant. Interesting. You can't send them that way. Well, I'm glad you know. I'm glad physicians know that because they're it's ultimately the responsibility of the doctor to protect your. Well, that's because I'm the one who gets a ten thousand dollar fine if something. <laughs> yeah, leaves. rightly so. Hey, um, we only got about a minute left, but I want to ask you about Project Echo from the. University of New Mexico, the ECHO stands for not Amazon's ECHO, but the Extension for Community Healthcare Outcomes. What is it? Basically, it's a way of providing specialist assistance to community doctors. Let's say an example, a patient has an unusual form of hepatitis. Right now, they send them to a hepatitis specialist, possibly in another part of the country. What this project does is it lets you have rounds. In other words, you can sit down a teleconferencing with 
specialists who say, you don't have to send them in. This is the drugs to give them. This is what to watch out for. You can get back to us. You can, you can, we can help you take care of the patient. It's to lower the cost and keep the patients in their home environment. I think that's and, great. And HIPAA and compliant, no doubt. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> and it's now rolling out. A, I mean, part of what I do, remember, I'm an intestinal failure specialist. And there's maybe 200 doctors who do that in the country. So I know whole areas where nobody does what I do. This would mean I could be part of the ECHO project. They could call me. Well, I want to keep your expertise coming. would be available in areas where it would otherwise would not. That's fantastic. Exactly. And this, this to I, me is the future of telemedicine. Thank it's you, Dr. Mom. Saying you have a wrap. Got to run. But I appreciate all the information always. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Why, well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Time to talk computers, the internet, home theater. We've got digital photography. We've got smartphones, smart watches. We've got all that jazz. 8888-ASK-LEO. That's the phone number. 888-827-5536. I have been remiss. We're going to take a lot of calls this hour. And I'm going to head right to the phones right now. So thank you for, I really appreciate it, for hanging on. Larry in San Francisco, you're first. Oh. Hi, Larry. Thanks for hanging on. Hey, Leo. No, no problem. I understand. Um, I actually have two questions regarding back. Well, one regarding backup, I guess. Uh, my sister tried is trying to restore. Like she has a laptop. But she has a Chronos as her backup. She wants to change hard drives from a spinning disk to an SSD. So she was trying to do it last night and following the instructions, which didn't make sense to me. But she followed the instructions, and now. The backup didn't, the restore from backup didn't work, and she can't get her laptop to recognize her old uh, hard drive. And she said that there were instructions in a chronos, like way down the list of things to do, that says when you shut down your computer, uh, make sure you hold down the F key when you're shutting down Windows so that Windows won't lock itself. And it seems like that her hard drive has locked itself. Her original hard drive has locked itself because she didn't know to do that. So I, I'm wondering if there's a way that she can unlock it. I'm baffled by that whole thing. <laughs> None of that makes any sense. So a Cronus, was she using a Cronus backup or a Cronus uh, true image? Which a Cronus? True program? image, I think, because she was trying to, she wanted to swap hard drives from... Yeah. So true image, uh, which is ex a perfect thing for that, you you take the original hard drive, you run true image, it makes an image of that drive. It's regardless of the contents of the drive, just sector by sector, and you can blast it onto a new drive. Uh, there are a couple of things that Windows does that is not good for this, but Acronis works within Windows and is smart about Windows, so it should be able to handle it. One of, one of those is Windows Fast Start, which is not a true shutdown. And I'm not sure what the F key, holding the F key when you shut down, does at all. That's that's new to me. I've not heard that one before. Uh, maybe the chat room knows. Did she have, was she locking her uh, drive before? No. No. So there's no reason that drive would be locked. Uh, the idea is that you can clone the old drive onto the new drive and it should just reboot. It did, she said, you said it failed in the, in the cloning, in the restore? Right. Um, she has a restore. But she made it on a separate external drive, I hope? Yes. Yes. Okay, good. Um, so when she started the restore, it went a little while and then didn't, and then said, I can't finish? What happened? Um, she said it started to, and then it couldn't finish. So she called me in a panic, and I told her, let's go into the BIOS of yeah. your laptop. If, if, if it doesn't finish, every... nothing you have is any good, so you're done. So you've already trashed that new disk because you put part of an operating system on it. Yeah, maybe, maybe she did that. Yeah, she definitely did that. That's an, It has to complete and verify, and then if it does that... Uh, then you should have an identical disk in the, on the SSD to the old disk, and it should boot just fine. So, but, her pro but her problem was I told her, okay, let's get you back to the beginning. Why don't you just put your old drive back in? Because she said, for some reason, my laptop's not recognizing the original drive. So we went into BIOS and, and changed all the settings to just default, and she put the uh, original spinning drive in her laptop, and it's still not recognizing C. It doesn't recognize the uh, original drive. Right. 
And that's why we thought maybe this thing about windows locking is why. Because she we even went to a command prompt because she knows a little bit about that. And she tried to use a command prompt to get it to look at her original drive, and it wouldn't do that either. So, yeah, in theory, you just put the old drive back in. You haven't modified the old drive in any right, way. Right, She didn't do it anything. Should all, it should all work. Um, huh. Don't. I'm not sure... You've reset the BIOS to defaults? Right. Okay. So it's the way it was, whatever that is. Um, the old drive should work exactly as it did before. You haven't done it? You haven't even modified it in any way? That's what I thought. So something has happened to the computer, maybe, but I don't know what. Um that's One of the odd things in the procedure she told me was that a chronist told her, take your old drive out, put, your, put the new drive in. No, first you back up the old drive. Then you take the old drive out, put the new drive in, yeah. put the old drive, connect the old drive as an external right. disk, and then restore that way. Exactly. That's, the all, that's exactly the proper process. Did she do that? She tried to, and that's when she started having yeah. problems. So... Yeah, I mean that that's all correct. What I'm worried is that she accidentally restored onto the old drive. You know, it's easy enough to do that by accident. You got to be very careful when you're doing this and of course Acronis warns you again and again, make sure. But if you restore the old the old drive on top of itself or you know you can you can mess it up. And I'm a, I think that might be what happened is that the old drive got messed up cuz maybe she did a restore in the wrong direction something like that that could be possible yeah. yeah it's easy enough to do by accident so you took the old drive out you put the new drive in it won't boot either what is the what no. is the error you're getting uh the error is it goes through it doesn't even go to post it just acts like it's not seeing a drive at all like it goes through post and then so i take it you're not in the same physical place as your sister no she's across the bay yeah so you know, maybe she didn't put it back in right. Maybe she didn't put it in the right spot. You know, I, none of this sounds like it's unrecoverable. Um, she one one thing she could do, probably should do at this point, is put the SSD back in and get a copy of Windows. You can get that. She's running Windows ten. Yes. So if she doesn't already have a Windows recovery drive, and everybody should do this, make get a sixteen gig USB drive. They're cheap and make a Windows recovery drive. It's built into Windows 10. And that way, if this happens, you could just boot to the Windows recovery drive, pretend that that uh, SSD has nothing on it, because it doesn't have anything useful on it, format it and install Windows on it, and get a clean copy of Windows on it. That's that, kind of what I wanted to do. That's the first thing to do. Then she should, unless the computer is somehow broken at this point, she should be able to get into Windows, and it's just like a brand new install. None of her data is on it, but that's okay because the old drive still has everything. We hope. Right. We're crossing right. our fingers. Once you can do that, then you verify that the computer is working, that there's nothing weird in BIOS that's preventing it from booting. Um, I'm afraid the old drive. Don't do this on top of the old drive. Do this on the new drive, obviously, right? Uh huh. Keep, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, uh, and 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 and, because treat that old drive like gold at this point, because that's her copy. And maybe she has backups, which would make me much happier. But <laughs> yeah, she does. She oh, good. Does Hallelujah. Everything up first. So let's try that first. Let's get a Windows recovery disk. If you don't have one, you can make it by going to Microsoft and get the Media Creators tool. You'll need a 16 gig USB thumb drive. You make a win make that into a Windows install disk. Uh, you have to reboot the machine and, and, you know, press F12 or whatever it is to get to the boot menu and boot into that USB drive. Reinstall Windows on that SSD, the brand new one. Make sure everything's working. Now you've got, in effect, like a new computer. Right. Right? And now that's all working. Now she can kind of start to troubleshoot what went wrong with the image backup. Good. That's what I suspected she should try to do. Yeah. And what I hope is that she didn't accidentally restore onto the backup. Cronus shouldn't let you do that. So I don't, I'm thinking that's probably not what happened, but it kind of sounds like somehow the old drive got damaged. And that's what I'm worried about. I don't know about this locking thing. I've never heard of that. She wasn't locking it anyway. No. So I don't think that's the issue. No, okay. Well, I'll tell her to try that. Yeah. And, can I, I and, have and then she'll have something useful anyway, which is a Windows installer. <laughs> exactly. It's always good to have. 
<laughs> and I have one question. Sure, Larry. Um, I've been using Carbonite for a long time because of your recommendation, but I know that they're sort of veering away from individuals now. Um, so I'm wondering if, if you have an alternative sort of Carbonite light backup that I could move to eventually. Oh, that's a great question. I don't. They haven't told me that they aren't going to support consumers anymore, but you're right. Their focus, and you can hear it in their ads, is business. And I think the, part of the reason is, and I don't want to put, I'm not putting words in their mouth, they've not told me this, but I suspect part of the reason is that the consumer business is not great, that it's a tough business to make money in. You know, there was such a good 60 bucks for everything. Come on, you know, you're not going to make money on that. And of, I mean, so so they were kind of giving it away. And I think that their business seems to be a better prospect for them. So let me, we have to take a break, but let's, uh, when we come back, let's talk about other ways to do a backup uh, you, you still want that cloud backup, but if you're a consumer, if you're not a business. And Carbonite still, as and, and I don't have no reason to think they're not going to continue to offer their consumer product, but there are other ways to do it. This is a good one we could all collaborate with. I'm, a, I'm still a Carbonite fan and Carbonite user for the home computer, but let's talk about some other choices. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Larry asks a great question. Um, the truth is Carbonite is still probably the easiest way to do it you pay for an account you press a button and it does it and you don't have to think about it, it does it in the background uh and there are competitors to carbonite uh they you know mosey which was one, the biggest competitor i think they acquired backblaze is still out there there's sugar sink i think is still out there but honestly of those and i and i and i'm not saying this because carbonite's a sponsor but carbonite is the easiest it's the one i use however a lot of people are rolling their own. And the reason I, I like Carbonite is it's for people uh, who aren't geeks who just want to do this, uh, you know, off-site backup, but don't want to have to figure a lot of stuff out. And for years, geeks have been using things like Amazon's Glacier, which is kind of an amazing uh, idea for backup. Amazon Glacier is... Uh, for backup that you won't need access to very quickly... If that if that makes sense, and as a result, it's very inexpensive. It moves slowly, like a glacier does, but your data is frozen solid, so it's always you know it's in deep freeze. So it's kind of a clever idea, and it's very affordable. The problem with it is, it's tricky to set up. You have to create an Amazon S3 account. You have to use all sorts of geeky uh, techniques to do it. But for price, it's probably the easiest, best way to, to do something like that. I think it's a it's a it's something to look into. I do it with my Synology NAS because, um, as many NASs do, they offer a, a plug-in that will do it kind of automatically. And, and by the way, this the whole point of this is it's great to have local backup. It's, it's imperative. Larry's sister needs local backup, right? But... Because that's going to be the fastest for her to get back up and running, or if you just need one file. But for true security, you also want backups that are off-site, that are not on your premises. So if you know the, there's a flood or a fire, and you lose the, the everything, including the backups, you still have that data in the cloud. And it's really important to do that with stuff that you just don't want to lose: old family photos, emails. Uh, financial records there there's got to be stuff there's stuff in your life if you think about it that's on your computer you just, just yeah, i can't lose this usually it's pictures right if it's just pictures this is the other thing i would say and one of the reasons i think carbonite probably figures the consumer market is going to be tough there are companies like amazon and google and microsoft and Flickr that are giving you virtually unlimited photo backup if you're an amazon prime member for instance you put the Amazon Photos app on your phone, it's just backing up everything unlimited, no questions asked. Google does the same thing, unlimited. They squeeze it a little bit to compress it, but I find the quality of the image is fine. Flickr offers a terabyte, which for most people is plenty. Uh, Microsoft OneDrive is inexpensive. I, I, I left out Apple. Probably the number one way people back up their photos is with iCloud Photos. And while Apple's storage isn't the cheapest, it's still fairly affordable, and it's automatic. You just you flip a switch on your computer, on your Mac, or on your iPhone, and you're backing up your photos. So for a lot of people, that's kind of the most important thing. If that's all you need to back up, then you don't need another third party. You're still you've got the cloud backup. 
I use uh, Adobe Lightroom, and Adobe now with this with the cloud subscription gives you st storage in their cloud. And in fact, <laughs> Lightroom just automatically puts everything up there. But that's nice because it syncs to your iPad and so forth. If there's other stuff though, like financial records, certainly the other way to do this is to look at consumer cloud services like Microsoft's OneDrive, Apple's iCloud, Dropbox is probably the most popular. Those also, they're, they're a little different than Carbonite. Carbonite will go to look at all your data folders and back it up. Dropbox will back up just a folder called Dropbox. But if you put the most important stuff in Dropbox, that works great. And it's backing it up to the cloud and it's available. The one caveat with these consumer cloud services, unlike Carbonite, uh, there's you know they have the key you can it's it's not really completely secure it's not completely private so if you encrypt it before it's uploaded then it's safe but you shouldn't put anything like i don't put tax returns for instance on on dropbox i don't i feel like that's um it's a little less safe because carb dropbox has the keys to that i'm trying to remember does carbonite i think carbonite might have the keys as well you know, for some stuff that you really want to keep secure, then there's there's other solutions. Uh, Google has backup and sync. Google Drive. I I pay a hundred bucks a year for two terabytes on Google. You know, that's another great solution, and that's for everything. But again, uh, if you want to keep it completely private, and this is what I do with tax returns, you encrypt it and then let it back it up. My uh, friend Steve Gibson calls that pre-internet encryption or PI. He used to call it pre egress encryption but the acronym for that wasn't very good 8888 ask leo on we go uh and i'd love to hear if you have other solutions too paul is in delaware ohio that's confusing oh, paul, no. hold on hold on hey, leo. hey paul are you at a picnic no i'm outside and everybody's saying happy easter happy, happy easter, easter. yay thanks paul what can i hey, do I'm for you China. oh okay so last last week uh, somebody called and they had a mesh network. Uh, they uh, hooked up to a mesh network and they couldn't get their wise camera working. Yes. And I use the I use the uh, Luma mesh network and a Google mesh network. Yeah. In my house. So yes. uh, when you have to hook up anything like a, a Sonoff or a wise cam to your uh, two gig, two point four network. It doesn't work because usually the phones and everything else are on a five gigahertz network. <laughs> so you have to choose. So, I've seen a lot of IoT devices that won't work on five gigahertz. So you have to figure absolutely. out which is your two point four and make sure you mesh you pair to that one. Yeah, but to get your phone, an Apple iPhone or an Android phone, to go into. Um, uh, 2.4 gigahertz mode. Yeah, and there is no real switch to choose that. Yeah, how do you do that? You walk. Yeah, you, you just walk far enough away from your house. <laughs> yeah, because five doesn't travel as far as far as 2.4. Brilliant. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Chris Markwart coming up. <laughs> that. <laughs> Paul, that's brilliant. I never even thought of that. Just walk far enough away that you can't get the five. That's brilliant. Exactly. That's so it's smart. <laughs> and it stays in the 2.4, and you could go back home, and you could hook up all your 2.4 nonsense. <laughs> that is, that's the funniest thing I ever heard. You're absolutely right. That way you're guaranteed to be on 2.4. Now, some net networks, Dr. Mom's telling me, and I, th I do remember this, Eero is smart enough not to, to try to get you know IoT devices on five gigahertz, but I have like my I, Molecule air freshener, it, it will connect to the five gigahertz network, but it won't work. And I bet you that's what was happening with this Wise, right? You have to make sure it's on yeah, the two point four. Yeah, Wise is tricky. It, it only will hook up to the two point four at this point until they update them. I guess that makes and a lot of know, sense. They're, they're great cameras, and it, you know it's a simple just walk away from your house until it switches over and then you're, you're good <laughs> you're brilliant paul go back to your easter thank right, you happy, happy yeah. easter paul i hope the easter okay, bunny bye. was good to you this year take care absolutely bye-bye bye-bye <laughs> bye -bye. that's hysterical i never even thought of that just walk away <laughs> oh man time for chris markward our photo guy 
He is a wonderful photographer in his own right. You could find uh, his workshops, and I, I've got to do one with Chris. I'm not going to do the one where it's cold, though, uh, to Svalbard, but he has workshops all over the world. <laughs> Discover the top We're floor. We're going com. to Greenland in fall, by the way. Greenland it's, is misnamed, is it not? Too. It's even colder. It kind of is. Yeah. It's kind of it's is, colder yeah. than Iceland. <laughs> yeah, but it's got it's got these beautiful, huge glaciers and amazing, amazing. I've seen your glacier photos, and, things, and yeah. they are truly gorgeous. So okay, yes. okay. So I was talking before uh, the break about how I'm discouraged because my wife is such a good photographer that I don't even want to take my camera out because I know she's going to get the better picture anyway. You're going to help me with that. <laughs> <laughs> What's the so, best way to get over that kind of? It is. It's an artist block. Uh, it's a fear of not taking, of not being able to take a good know, picture. You know, worst case, put that camera away for a month or two. I mean, that's what I sometimes do. If I, if, if do I get, you? A, but you're a professional yeah, photographer. Sometimes. You can put it away. Well, if I have jobs, I pay jobs. I won't put it away. But I have these downtimes in between the, the tours, the photo tours I do, the travel I do. There's lots of office work and stuff. And then sometimes I don't be, um, I don't feel motivated, and I yeah. just put the cameras away. And that's a good uh, idea. Sometimes you need to ref stuff, yeah. re refuel, recharge, refresh. The it, other it option would helps. I could take Lisa's camera away. <laughs> I don't think she would appreciate no. that. Um, <laughs> no, but but you know you know it's kind of normal, especially over winter when the light is bad yeah, and there's, there's not much going on. That not, but you yeah, kind of yeah. kind of yeah. But, I mean, I was in New Zealand, so I was in summer. It was beautiful, oh. but. Uh, I know all these winters where I, when I've been here and the motivation kind of fades away. But now it's springtime. It's coming. We had some beautiful sunny days here. And uh, I think it's just time to reboot. And, you know, what would I like? I like to throw a lot of the technology overboard for... Um, for just simplifying things a bit um, and just take the smartphone out. Maybe and that in a way is a problem as I have too many choices. Possible, possible. Yeah, I'm overwhelmed. So, yeah. So I've I've brought you three iPhone apps this time around. Okay, I'm ready. Are kind of fun uh, that give you a bit of a a choice. Let's start with uh, one that came out not too long ago called Spectre, mm -hmm. which is a long exposure app, which which does long exposures in daytime and in nighttime, and it lets you do things like clear people moving people from a photo by oh. just when they move they will just kind of disappear so this is so something traditionally you could do with a regular camera as you said well, a long exposure time but you could never do this with a smart a smartphone you'd need an nd filter or something to to get really long exposures but this one is doing that plus some math and it just takes things out you hold a camera up for five to ten seconds and it will do some magic. Do you need a tripod? We, no, no. You, do, you just hold it. It shows you a little square that needs to be inside another square. So you oh, hold the camera kind of steady. This is from and the folks course, who do Halide, which is th probably the best the iPhone guys. camera uh, app of all. So it this, also lets you do light trails in the dark. So I know. I love those that. Car lights, and yeah. you can do these with a smart uh, with that software. Yeah. And uh, Long exposures during the day when if you have like flowing water and you want to make this really soft, um, Spectre can do that. So I think it's two ninety nine right now. Um, also, fairly easy buy for me. Very good. Yeah, S P E C T E R. So, it's in the App Store on iOS. Right. Oh no, I'm um, see T R E. I apologize. It's spelled the British way. S P E C T R E. Yes. So, uh, second one that I came across a while ago is for those people who have an iPhone with multiple lenses that can do depth, um, and you know how you can change the aperture in your in your uh, Photos app, in your camera app. But there's a there's a piece of software that makes use of that pretty well, and it's called Focos F O C O S, and it's. It's for those who want to nerd out with the depth information in the photo because it will not only allow you to change the the aperture, it will allow you to tap to focus. So you can tap to different things in the photo background to focus on them after the fact. So after the photo has been taken, you can change the, the bokeh in like 
it, it simulates 14 different lenses, wow. which I find interesting. So it wow. uses the the geometry of uh, the aperture and and kind of calculates in, it in there. You can have depth effects, which goes to so as far as you can change the background. You don't need a green screen or anything because the camera knows where the background is. So this is kind of like Apple's own portrait mode, but on steroids. It is, but it's on steroids, yeah. So yeah. again, it's 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 a bit involved, but um, it is. You can even do light effects, like put a light source in in the three dimensional space and light a face or something with it. So that is a very very uh, in depth look at what the cameras do now with their multiple cameras and the depth that they get from that. It really is also a testament to the quality of the iPhone uh, everything, not just the, the the lens, the sensor in the camera, but the processor in it, because a lot of this is computational, right? It's the computer yep, that's taking going, the yeah. image and doing stuff to it. Exactly, and uh, with the depth information plus the photo, that's what Focus uses. And yeah. uh, I've been spending way too much time playing with some of that and the third one is a bit of a fun one that uh, it's just you, you know the, the guys you know jib jab the guys who did um, jib jab yes i do elf yourself <laughs> yes you know every year they i have, subscribe for christmas so i can send out jib jab christmas cards with dancing they have elves a little app they have a little app on ios called gif gab g i f g a b which uh, lets you make tiny little animated gifs that you can send out to friends with with your face in them or their face oh, in them fun. i've actually made one of you go uh -oh. to go to go to tfttf.com slash easter leo uh -oh. this, 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 <laughs> now i'm worried <laughs> took, took, took me about took me about 30 seconds to make that uh, so, i love it now does this cost anything um, no, that one I think is free. Oh, nice. Because in the uh, past I've had to subscribe to Jib Jab to use their features. And after, you know, it's like five bucks a month. After a while I'm thinking, this is getting expensive. That's why I stop yeah. until until the holidays and then I resubscribe. And this one integrates into iMessage, so you will nice. even have to uh, have it have it okay. in there. Just downloading quick, it now. Downloading quick ones it now. To friends, yeah. Actually, the, I do did have the other ones you mentioned already because i uh, there's some really great iphone camera apps and those are two of the best but i don't have gif gab or gif jab depending on <laughs> whichever <laughs> depending on what i don't know what well, how you pronounce gif i guess how do you pronounce gif it's a gif yeah okay of course so, it is yeah <laughs> there's, I, there's no discussion you know here. you know the guy who wrote it says it's gif and uh everybody always says that to me I've always said GIF. I'm with yeah, you. But he, but he said that like a hundred years later. Yeah, he made it up. That's, just, that's, that's a just retro a pronunciation. Yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> three great apps. I'll put links in uh, the uh, show notes to uh, all three so you can uh, download them on, on your iPhone. Uh, there are very good Android camera apps too, but I have to say oh, yes, most, of the, most of the really interesting stuff is being done on the iPhone. Uh, right now, but well, I did point out that I on my S10, most of the pictures that I took that I liked the best in Hawaii were on my camera phone, not my <laughs> fancy Sony A9 camera with the expensive GM lens and all that stuff. No, it was just my uh, S10 Plus. It did a great job. Your camera, you you got a camera phone. You probably have most of what you need. Very true. Very true. They are amazing these days. Yeah. What's our assignment, Mr. Marquardt? The assignment is still up for probably a week. It's the Apple assignment. Take a picture of an actual apple. Oh, a, man. The fruit. The fruit, not the very computer. Simple, very right. simple. Lots of pictures of apples already there. Upload it to our Flickr group, the Tech Guy group on Flickr. And in a week or two, Chris will pick three for review. Leo Laporte, the Tech Guy. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I have to say, uh, I was. I didn't want to bring out, break out the kit. I just wanted to. I was carrying this with me, and it, because it has three lenses, wide, medium, and, and long, it really was able to do everything I wanted. But Lisa, I have to say, this this picture. There were chickens everywhere in Kauai. <laughs> That's a nice one. And I love the is, colors isn't on that, that one. Yeah. The color in this is gorgeous. Yeah. 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 <sighs> That's what I put my camera away. We'll have to. <laughs> we'll, we'll have to do something. Uh, Leo Laporte, the tech guy.
88-88. Ask Leo. Marie in uh, Santan Valley, Arizona. Hello, Marie. Thanks for hanging on. Hey, Leo. Hey, no, no problem. I just have a quick question. It seemed like a couple of weeks ago before you went on vacation, you mentioned that you no longer use Gmail because it's very invasive. But you didn't say what you used as an alternative to that. That's a good question. And I'm not recommending uh, people abandon Gmail because of all the free email solutions, it's the best. But anytime something's free, there's a way they're making money on it. And, of course, of course. with Gmail, uh, it's ads. Uh, that's Google's real business. They have a lot of wonderful products, and I use a great many of them. But almost all of them are designed with the intent of getting you to see more ads from Google because that's where their money comes from. So right, right. the other problem I had with Gmail, I used to use it uh, primarily because it had the best anti-spam filtering of all. You know, it really does. Yeah. And so that's it's a very... Amazing, really. Yeah, considering you're paying nothing for it, uh, right. the ads aren't intrusive, and you get the best spam filtering ever. I think there's... I'm not really telling people move away from Gmail. But I did, I did, and I did for some particular reasons. One, because my Gmail address was laporte at gmail.com. And this is, a, you know, I got it when Gmail first came out 12 years ago, right. uh, and I was ignorant at the time. But my strong advice when you get an email address is not to use something guessable, something simple. Don't be, there's a guy who has Jim at AOL.com. And as you might imagine, it's unusable. Because if you, <laughs> if you just have a first name at a well-known email address, you're going to get so much junk mail. And the problem with Laporte is that I get junk mail in French. A lot of it. Oh, okay. <laughs> I also, and there's nothing I could do about this, because I use Google Hangouts, which is attached to the same account, I get a lot of, I think it's probably scammers pretending to be attractive young French women approaching oh, yeah. me in French. <laughs> and, of course, because France is on European time, I get texts at 3 in the morning. <laughs> From, you know, oh, these uh, seemingly, I doubt they really look like that, attractive young ladies saying, Coucou, comment ça va? Bonjour. And I don't want to well, talk to them. must make them, your <laughs> missus very happy. Well, she understands. <laughs> <laughs> I don't respond to them. I'm not an idiot. Uh, so, exactly. so those two reasons alone have made, but that's my problem. If you were Laporte738926 at gmail.com, this wouldn't be a problem. Right? So... That's unique to me. So what I did with uh, Gmail, uh, since I have a lot of stuff signed up that way, I still have to use it. It's my Google account. So I just put a vacation reminder on it, which you can do. They have a nice feature which says, I don't use this for personal mail anymore. Please. Uh, no, I'm smart. I'm not an idiot. I don't say, please start sending mail to this address. <laughs> I say, ask me and I'll give you my new address. <clears throat> and that way the spammers okay. can't follow the trail to the new address. Uh, so I do use a commercial service. So this is the disadvantage. I pay for it. Oh, okay. And the commercial service, and I do recommend it heartily. It's really good. It's an Australian company called Fastmail at fastmail.com. And the okay. other reason I prefer it, you know, first of all, you're paying for it. It's not hugely expensive. But uh, How much is it? Do you oh, know? I can't remember. I think it's uh, $30 a year, something around that. It's not oh, It's not. It's not reasonable. Yeah, it's not prohibitively. Do they, do they filter out ads as well? Or? They have, a, I think, a more effective but more manual uh, spam filter called Spam Assassin. That, but you uh -huh. have to, you can config the g default configuration is pretty good. What I did for years was get the mail at Gmail, then have Gmail filter out spam, and then send it on to Fast Mail. But this French problem, oh. this French problem, actually killed it. But so you could keep your Gmail account. <laughs> And just okay, that's actually pretty funny. Yeah, it was kind of like a. I always thought of it as a three-stage sewage filtration system. So the Gmail would really get the bulk of it, and then I would use the spam assassin on fast mail to get the you know kind of specialized remainder. For instance, I have a of a spam assassin rule that says if if the email comes from a Chinese uh, domain, just goes right to the trash because I don't get any mail from China except spam. Oh, well, of course. Yeah, that kind of thing. So, okay, so what you're actually saying then is that it, the, the alternative is is not like something you would just have or use. 
I mean, it's you just, know, for me, email like, is a like big. A free, it's not like free like Gmail. Yeah, is. Gmail's a good choice, the good default choice for everybody. But for me, email is really important, right? It's um, and anybody in business, I think this is probably true. This is this is a, a critical, and I need I get so much of it, literally thousands of emails a day. Wow. Um, that I need to do, I have to have a lot of processing capability. That's the other reason I like fast mail is they have something called spam sieve, which is a scripted filtering system that's extremely powerful, more powerful than Gmail's. But for most, again, for most people, combined Gmail's excellent spam filtration. Uh, Google has said two years ago that they would stop examining your mail for keywords for ads that didn't work very well people didn't like it so they don't do that there's i think a common misconception they read your email uh they don't do that anymore not for ad purposes of course anybody that does spam filtration has to look at the contents of your email a program has to go through that but google's not collecting keywords for advertising so i think that's good well speaking of the ad thing you were just saying uh i have one other question can i ask you something about Facebook? Of course. Um, every time you do a search on your computer for anything, uh, obviously it shows up on uh, on Facebook. <clears throat> Is there a way to turn off their capability of looking at what I search for online? Facebook generally will only see stuff you search for while you're on Facebook. No, these are <clears throat> not at all. They so if you do a Google search in your browser, Facebook's not seeing that. Uh, immediately after I search for something, immediately after it shows up on Facebook as an ad. Really? Well, yeah, every, uh, every time. Let's um, say if I wanted to, you know, look for. Uh, how, how do you do your searches? How do you do your um, your, your your internet searches? You, uh, I do it through um, uh, Chrome. So up in the Chrome address bar, you'll type up you know a search. Exactly. And <clears throat> and you search for something, and now. Well, I mean, I'll give you an example. Uh, you guys, one of your other uh, on-air personalities, recommended a certain ty uh, name of a sheet. Yeah, like for betting. Yeah. So I I went online to exactly where he said. Yeah. And and in, within I don't know five minutes. It. All right, I'll tell you how that happened. <laughs> so the search they didn't see the search, but as soon as you go to a website, many many websites have Facebook like buttons or Facebook connect buttons on those websites. Mm -hmm. As soon as you go to that site. It can see your Facebook account cookie, which is stored on your computer, because you're you're you know when you log into Facebook, it puts a cookie in there, so you don't have to keep entering your password every time, right? It can see that and immediately, yes, absolutely, says, "Hey, guess what? Uh, Marie's really in the market for sheets. You should start putting some sheet ads in there." So that's not the search Facebook's seeing. Google, believe me, Google doesn't want to share your search with them. That's Google stuff. Now, a Google search may result in a Google ad for something, but it shouldn't result in a Facebook ad. On the other hand, anytime you go to a page, and, and oh, when we come back, I'm going to talk about this because we've just learned 33 mental health apps, recent study, are sending fin for information about your mental health state back to Facebook. Lots of apps, lots of web pages have connections back to Facebook. Facebook encourages this. They make it easy and as a result, and, and sites say, well, it's great, it's social sharing. Well, as a result, that's how Facebook's learning where you're going on the Internet. Google's not sharing that information with Facebook. That wouldn't be in their interest. But Facebook is being, you know, that information is being shared with websites and apps all the time. Exactly. So you, you ask a really good question, Marie. I'm so glad you asked that. And you see now how that's happening? You go to Bowl and Branch or whatever. <laughs> And, and exactly, that, that's exactly where I went. Yeah, yeah. and Bolin Branch, uh, almost certainly somewhere, it may not even be visible to you, has a connector back to Facebook. A lot of times it is visible. It's a like button or uh, you, you've seen this before when you log into a site, create a new account. It'll say you can create a new account using your email or you can use your Facebook, Google, and Twitter account. Well, I was a little bit 
concerned because I mean I I don't really do Facebook per se. But you have an account. Uh, yes, I do. That means However, you do Facebook. <laughs> I don't do anything on it. <laughs> it's fa Let me put it this way. <laughs> you may not do Facebook, but Facebook is doing you. Wow. <laughs> Let me show you because well, I... That I'm, sounded bad. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, <laughs> unfortunately, it's pretty accurate. Um, let me show you. I'm going to... Wow. If I go to the Bowling Branch site, which I'm doing right now, and I go to the very bottom, it says uh -huh. connect with us. There's a, li a little print that has a Facebook link, a Twitter link, a, uh, I don't know what that is, path link, and an Instagram link. Underneath each of those is code on that page that connects directly back to those sites. We call this, Facebook actually does this to people even without Facebook accounts. Uh, wow. they're, they're called shadow accounts. And when Mark Zuckerberg went to Congress to testify, they asked him about that. And he said, oh, we don't do that. What? what? I don't know what you're talking about. Let me ask my people. <laughs> but in fact, they do that. And wow. because their business, just like Google, their business is learning about what you're interested in and showing you ads. And of course, if you, you and by the way, you may not, it may not even be a disadvantage. You are interested in sheets. So maybe putting an ad for an alternative sheet <laughs> manufacturer on here. Might be something you'd be interested in. It's better than an ad for, I don't know, barbed wire. <laughs> right? So so that's yeah. ad customization. The bigger concern many of us have is that Facebook seems to be doing more than just using this to customize ads or to tell advertisers, hey, we have, you know, we have a half million people who have recently searched for sheets. Would you like to buy ads against that? That's one thing. Well, and I don't find that as offensive. Showing up. It does seem to be showing up a, a whole lot more than it ever did before. Yeah, and so that that is more a factor of whether people want the ad and so forth, whether they're selling that. There's ad. really no way to stop them. Well, of course you can um, you can do what I did, which is kill your Facebook account. And then, and then and, I, I'm pretty close to that, actually. Yeah, I mean, if if you. The problem is most people don't because this is how they stay in touch with their grandkids or their family or their high school classmates and stuff. And there's no other way to do it. So they don't want to. So you have to weigh to, I mean, honestly, and this is the same thing with Gmail, same thing with using Google. When you use Google, you're sending Google signals about stuff you do in your search. True, true. Right. And they're going to show you more ads for that stuff. I don't mind that, but here's my problem. <laughs> Facebook does more than just sell ads with this stuff. They share this data in other ways, and this was the whole Cambridge Analytica scandal. They share this data oh. <laughs> in, 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 in ways that could subvert our democracy. You know, they share it with, with R Russians who want to influence the election. They, well, and apparently they did a pretty good job. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah everybody's happy. <laughs> I got to hand them, to, I gotta hand them back. They're very, well, and this is the problem is these guys, you know, technologists are very good at this stuff. And you would never know from looking at that bowl and branch site at the very bottom, because I, you know, I had to look where, where is the link? But there is a link at the very bottom to to Facebook and to Twitter and Pinterest. You know what? I never even that was very good information. I've never even considered that. Yep, you'd never know. Never. But it's not. But by the way, every site does that. And and mm -hmm. it's not because Bowl and Branch <laughs> is trying to send information back to Facebook. It's just that fa they 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 want you to share on Facebook, and as a result, Facebook has gotten some information about you, probably. Uh, Bowling Branch is rethinking this because, <laughs> because frankly, it's not good for them. They're not; it's not in their interest. They don't want other sheet manufacturers <clears throat> to put ads on your Facebook page. They might lose you as a customer. Well, actually, that you're right about that because that would be not advantageous to them at all. Exactly. Oh, huh, interesting. But they've decided you know, that it was an. It's just been annoying because every single time I turn around yeah. or look at anything and that's why i thought it was a situation where you could turn off 
No. Something regarding ad, uh, ads and stuff. I mean, I'm, well, there are ways to do I'm it. Not con- I'm not computer literate. That's the problem. But I'm not no. But I'm not computer illiterate right. either. There are ways to do to, it. I know how to look up stuff, and you know. There are ways to do it if you're very privacy focused. You can, for instance, turn off scripts that might be used in that way, and so forth. But nothing is okay. perfect, and. Um, I'll be I'll be honest with you. Uh, it, it, it's kind. Of, what I would ask yourself is, well, do you mind that ads are customized based on your interests? Well, <clears throat> only to the extent uh, if I'm looking up something very specific like that, the Bull and Branch, I'm really not interested in something else. Yeah. So that's the real question. It, is it, it is only because of the the code and getting uh, money off if you use yeah. it way and I don't mind so, honestly I don't mind th- that kind of information being shared it's that happens and all has happened even before the internet era but uh, I mean when you when you get a Safeway card or you know have oh, you yeah, yeah. What, yes. you've seen the CVS uh, receipt you get with all those <laughs> all those coupons on it I mean everybody does this and it's been done for years and by the way, those coupons are based on your purchases at CVS. They're paying attention, but it's become weaponized by, you know, Internet technologies. I don't personally mind that. I do mind it, though, that they're using information beyond just things, you know, sites I visit and stuff. And they're using it in ways I'm not thrilled about. So I, oh, that's, yeah, like I said, the only reason I was trying to figure out a way to to stop that is because obviously they're getting that information somehow somewhere so in chrome and the, i didn't i didn't care for it yeah so this is exactly it in chrome there are plugins there's one called privacy badger you can get at the chrome extension store to turn that on it will block these kinds of cookies if you really want to do something privately you can also uh in chrome they have a private browsing tab you can open a new private window and uh-huh. uh, that is a little more private. Uh, it may not block those kinds of cookies. I would recommend Privacy Badger as an extension. And then there's another... Ex- when you do... Well, a quick question is, so yeah. if you do like the control shift in and use incognito to look something uh-huh. up, uh, if somebody has uh, uh, the cookie capability, does that block it if you use incognito? Yeah. And it, it prevents them from saving additional cookies, which is good. But it doesn't. It may not effectively block this bug, this Facebook bug on the page. So for that, you want to use Privacy Badger. Oh boy! Okay. So incognito mode only is goes there, so far. Is there a cost for this private nope, badger? No, it's it's free. Privacy Badger. It's free. Privacy Badger. Yep, it's an extension. So you go to settings, extensions. It's in the Google Extension Store. I highly recommend it. It's quite good. Well, you've been very helpful. I appreciate that. My pleasure. Take care. Thank you very much for your time. Well, hey, hey, hey. How are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Time to talk computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography, and protecting yourself against snoops on the internet. I love Marie's call, uh, and and I want to go a little bit farther into it. The last call... Uh, of the hour last hour she said well every time i do a search facebook seems to have an ad for that product within five minutes on my facebook page how does facebook know what i'm searching for well they don't that's the good news google does not share that information with facebook hallelujah of course google keeps track of it your google ads will get smart they base ads on your search results all the time but what happened in this case and happens all the time she was searching for a particular sheet brand. She went to the Sheets site, the sheet brand site. Actually, Sheets I use, they're great, Bowl and Branch. They were an advertiser for a long time. Uh, and so then immediately she got advertisements in Facebook for other Sheets, other brands. She said, how would they know that? Well, I went to look at the Bowl and Branch site, and I bet you there are a lot, almost every site does this. At the very bottom, it says, connect with us. They want you to share. Connect with them on Facebook, on Twitter, on Pinterest, and on Instagram. And they have little icons for the four sites. Well, underneath those icons is a little script provided by those companies, Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, Instagram, which is also Facebook. 
that they use for that. And that sends a signal. When you go to Bowling Branch, you don't even have to click the button. Just the fact that you load that page, loads that script, says to Facebook, ah, Marie is at Bowling Branch. This is what Facebook, how Facebook makes its money. They now have a, they aren't selling Marie's name back to other sheet companies, no. But what they have is they have a list of, say, 100 million people. And, and Facebook is operating at that kind of scale, who've searched for sheets in the last 30 days. And if you're another sheet manufacturer or you're Bowling Branch, you can go the, to the Facebook and say, I'd like to buy all those people who searched for sheets or went to a sheet site in the last 30 days. And you can buy that ad. And that's what's happening. That's why she's seeing an ad, probably not for Bowling Branch, but for a, another company trying to steal their business. That's why I say it's not Bowling Branch doing this. They don't want to do that. Except it is, but they just they aren't aware of the consequences, I guess. It's Facebook doing it. Now, that's the modern world we live in. And it, by the way, predates the Internet. You have a loyalty card for your favorite grocery store or drugstore. Why do you think they have loyalty cards? Well, they give you a great discount and they keep track of what you buy. Right? And use that information. They may even sell, probably do, sell that information to the companies whose products you buy. It's gotten so sophisticated that, in fact, if you went and bought Pringles using a loyalty card at CVS, first of all, you'd get that four-foot-long CVS receipt that would have an offer for either Pringles, more Pringles, or another potato chip company, whoever paid CVS more. And CVS may well sell that information to another potato chip company. And you may, on your Facebook page, get ads for potato chips because you bought Pringles at CVS. It's that sophisticated. And again, I don't really have a problem with that because I'm going to see ads one way or the other. I'd prefer to have ads for stuff I'm interested in. I like potato chips. I want to see potato chip ads, I guess. It's not, it's not a choice between ads and no ads. It's a choice between ads for stuff you're interested in or not. And if they stopped there, I'd be fine. But they don't. And this is the problem. These companies have become so addicted to the value of that information that they become aggressive about collecting it. Now, these little buttons on websites are just the beginning you may not know it but apps that you use may also be sharing data this week the verge published a blockbuster story rachel becker uh actually this is based on a um, study published in jama the jama jama network open journal journal of the american medical association researchers searched for apps using the keywords depression and smoking cessation. So they were looking for apps that would either be about depression or to handle depression or to stop smoking. They downloaded the apps, and then they used sophisticated tools to monitor the kinds of data those apps sent out from their phones. 33 of the 36 apps they downloaded shared information that could get advertisers or data analytics companies insights into people's digital behavior. A few of them actually shared stuff like health diary entries, self-reports about substance abuse, and linked it to your username as well. Now we've got a problem. But that's what's happened is these companies have so, become so addicted to knowing everything they possibly can, to building a dossier about every single thing you do, both on and offline, that they don't see any boundaries. They don't see any places that they shouldn't collect information. They're collecting information about your mental state, what you're eating, your substance abuse, this kind of stuff that people who are using these apps are assuming is private. Probably the app even says that it's private. But if you read the privacy agreement very often they'll say we will share information with third parties to make the app better that's a big one just it's for it's for making the app better or making the app owners more money or <laughs> it makes the app better and that's a big problem and so marie was quite reasonably saying well what can i do chat room suggested a good choice if you're using uh i think firefox or uh or Google Chrome. I think many browsers, but uh, search in your browser for an extension 
in, in the case of Google, it's at the Chrome Web Store called Privacy Badger. There are a number of companies, uh, or mo mostly nonprofits, who've made this is from the Electronic Frontier Foundation. This is a nonprofit. I support them every year, every month with a donation because they do such good work. The EFF created Privacy Badger to let you know. It automatically blocks these invisible trackers we were talking about. Now, it's, it's not perfect. It's not going to stop every form of snooping on you, but it's going to give you a little help. There is, built into browsers today, something called a do not track setting. It, it actually is a setting you can turn on that tells the site you're visiting, please don't track me. But there's no requirement that the site adhere, you know, follows your request, and most don't. Privacy Badger does. It pays attention to your setting. If it sees do not block, it starts blocking. You should read about it. It's free. It's from the EFF. This is one of the reasons I, I strongly support the EFF. Uh, and it gives you a little more control over these little bugs, these little trackers that are on almost every web page. <sighs> you know, this is kind of why I started this show 20 years ago, because... I wanted to give us, as users, a defense against the technologies being used by big companies. And, and this is a perfect example, isn't it? 8888 Ask Leo, do not track is voluntary. <laughs> I, <laughs> I voluntarily choose not to listen. <laughs> I turn it on, but I, you know, I know nobody's paying any attention. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. It really is a, uh, a an issue and a conversation that could go on a long time about privacy online. I guess, uh, you know, it's important to understand that you, just as you don't have any privacy rights really in public, or very limited privacy rights in public, you're essentially in public when you're online. So if you think of it that way, I think that's helpful. And just as people can see you going into a store, honestly, people can see you going into a website. Who can see? Well, your your uh, ISP can see. Your ISP sees all, right? Your internet service provider or your mobile carrier if you're on a phone. The program you're using can see. If you search in Google, <clears throat> Google sees your searches. If the site you're going to has, and most do, trackers of any kind on it, the people those trackers connect up to can see you go into the store. Everybody. Everybody, everybody who has an interest can. And the thing that's changed, I guess, uh, well, first of all, now we have this awareness, but the thing that's changed is how pervasive it is, how effective it is, thanks to technology. And the thing that worries me is how it is being used, and it's being used in ways that maybe we didn't anticipate. And I think the number one way uh, that we're now aware of, it's, it was used by the Russians to try to influence the election in 2016. Uh, almost certainly they will continue to try to use that. And so that's something to be aware of. Uh, that's not legal, but there's really no way for it not... <laughs> for <laughs> Companies like Facebook pretend they can't stop it. Well, we didn't know. And I don't think they're much incentive to stop it because, honestly, this is, this is their business model. We, you know, very simply, they sell your, your uh, information to third parties for, for purposes of advertising. Now, you might say, well, Leo, don't be hypocritical. You you have advertising, a lot of advertising. Everything I do is, uh, and I, and I, for my whole life, my whole career for 40-some years, has been uh, free ad-supported media, radio and television, and, and now podcasts. Uh, I would say that there's a difference there uh, because we don't know who's listening on the radio. We don't know who's watching on the TV. And we don't know who's listening on the podcasts. And we very intentionally, certainly on my podcast network, I don't have any trackers. We don't. We refuse trackers. Advertisers want them. They ask for them all the time. We don't do it because I want to respect your privacy. It's easy for me to do that because all of the stuff I do is very highly targeted at people like you and tech enthusiasts. And that's usually for an advertiser enough. They know that. And that's why most of our ads are aimed at tech enthusiasts. That makes sense, right? That's all I need to know. It's kind of a self-selecting audience. But increasingly, uh, this is a, a big pressure point for broadcasters. 
almost all of the digital ad sales now, something like 80%, go to two companies, Google and Facebook. And they go to those companies because advertisers know it's the most efficient way to buy advertising. They're, they're buying exactly the people who will buy their product. There's the old saying with uh, traditional advertising, main, mass media advertising, that uh, I know half my money... I know my money, let's see, let me get it right here. I know my advertising works, I just don't know which half. I know half my advertising, I blew it. I don't know, I know half my advertising works, I just don't know which half. That's the problem. If you're Coca-Cola, well, you know, everybody drinks Coke. So a, a Coca-Cola ad on the Super Bowl, that's going to hit a lot of people who are potential customers. But an ad for remote PC on the Super Bowl, well... That's a tougher sell, right? That's expensive. You're buying a lot of eyeballs, but only a smaller percentage of those are actually potential customers. So what we're seeing, and it's a lot of pressure on radio and television, is advertisers say, well, I would like to know 100% of my ads work. I would like to know that my ads are going to people who are going to buy my product. Guess who, got, guess who offers that? Facebook and Google. But we as consumers ought to understand that the reason Facebook and Google can offer that is because they watch our every move. They're, you know, and so we have to decide, is that okay? I personally think it is okay as long as they stick to you know, selling advertising to a group of people. If Facebook says, well, we know there's 100,000 tech enthusiasts in the, uh, in the western states. Would you like to buy ads against those people? I don't have a problem with that. I'm in that group, I'm going to see that ad, but I don't have a problem with that. But when they start collecting information from mental health applications, uh, from menstrual apps like Flow, the Wall Street Journal blew the lid off that one, they're actually collecting when women are, are in their time of the month. Should Facebook be allowed to collect that? Is that okay? Advertisers want to know. I'd say none of their business. So we do draw the line. It's a, it's a big topic. It's a topic, actually, we spent a lot of time talking about on the podcasts. And I do really think it's important for uh, everybody who, well, walks the earth these days, especially young people, to become literate in this subject so that they know what information they're giving out and they have a choice about it. And that's why we also mentioned, and I'll put a link in the show notes, the Electronic Frontier Foundation's excellent plugin called Privacy Badger. It's not perfect, but it goes. It, it does its best to protect you. I also mentioned the Brave browser because it's based on Chrome, but it's got built-in ad protections. It's not from Google. See, Google's never going to give you a browser that protects you. <laughs> it's not. It's against their interests. Facebook's not going to stop using these bugs. That's how they make their money, and a lot of money too. So we're going to have to, you know, think about it and do the best we can. I don't think any solution is perfect. When you're, again, when you're on the internet, you're in the, you're in public, and uh, unfortunately, there are people who are very interested in what you're doing. So I don't know. I don't, you know, I, I guess your choice would be to not use the internet. By the way, I should point out that the most intrusive device of all is your phone. If you carry a smartphone. You're carrying a device with a microphone, a camera, a GPS, an accelerometer, constant connection to the Internet, and a host of apps that are perfectly happy to send that information and more back to the mothership, whoever that mothership is. You, you've got the ultimate surveillance device in your pocket every day. And uh, <laughs> you know, there aren't really very many good ways to, to make that more private, unfortunately. Yeah. It's just, uh, it's just. I think it's what we, what we live with these days. Uh, Eighty. I'm sorry. I had to give you a little sermon on this Easter Sunday, a little privacy sermon. We're going to get back to the phones. Aaron and Gary and Doug and Mike. Thank you so much for your patience. Hang on. We're gonna, we're gonna get to you in <laughs> just a little bit. Uh, I will do all calls for the rest of the show because I've been talking an awful lot. But boy, I think that is a uh, such an important topic. Marie broached, and I, and I, and I'm glad she asked because I think a lot of people either don't pay attention or just assume, yeah, well, somehow when I do a search, searches go back to the company you search with. In fact, a lot of people refuse to use Google for searches, use DuckDuckGo, because DuckDuckGo says, well, we don't collect information. But that only takes one person out of the equation. You still have your ISP. You still have your mobile carrier. 
<laughs> you still have all the apps. All of them are also paying attention. I think it's virtually impossible to make everything you do online private. You're in public. That's just kind of the way it is. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. More of your calls right after this. I am not a privacy Nazi. I'm not. I, uh, I accept that, uh, you know, I kind of live in public. I always have, and I don't mind. And, you know, I think, honestly, the best way to think about it is there's some stuff you don't mind if people know. I don't care if somebody knows I'm buying Pringles at the local CVS. I don't mind if a sheet manufacturer says, oh, you're buying sheets. Hey, well, wh what about these? That's okay. You know, you have to figure out what it is you don't want others to see, what you want private. And you should, and this is where we have a problem, have the right to choose. You should be able to say, well, you can know this, but I don't want you to know that. We need to work on that. Aaron in Los Angeles, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Thanks for hanging on, Aaron. No problem, Leo. Um, uh, first time, long time. <laughs> Thank you. Great to have you. Uh, um, I had a question about, um, well, let me give you a little bit of history. I am disabled, and um, I broke my iPad Air 2. Oh, man. I, I shattered the glass. So, unfortunately, that's an uh, expensive fix if I wanted to get it fixed. So, I'm looking to see about getting a new tablet. Um, my yeah, you know, at this on. point, the, the fix for an Air 2 would probably cost more than the least tablet. expensive iPad, which is around uh, three hundred twenty nine dollars. Yeah, so I'm actually looking to get something different. Um, my use for my iPad has, you know, diminished really. I really use it, or well, I don't even use it for what I wanted to use it for, which is uh, kind of uh, reading books and then also reading comic books. On oh man, it's iPad. perfect for that. You don't use it for that. I do, but I, I don't use it as much for reading. I don't know why. I just, something about paper books. But. It, it's a little hard. I'll be honest. It's a little hard on the eyes. I mean, there's a very different uh, experience looking at light coming out of a screen as opposed to light bouncing off a piece of paper. It's just a very different experience. So yeah. I'm the same way. I thought I would be doing a lot more. I, I, I used a Kindle for a while. That's a little bit easier on the eyes. But honestly, yeah. uh, I, you know, I, I don't use the iPad for reading that much. It's and, I, not... and I actually and I actually did have a Kindle for a while, but I, again, the whole bouncy, you're right about the bouncing light off of paper versus yeah. the screen. So what do you use the iPad? What do you, well, let's not say iPad. What, let's say, what do you use a tablet for? Right now, my main use is, uh, of course, searching for Google stuff. <laughs> so, yeah, web browsing. Okay, yeah, that's. And then, and then I read comic books on it. So, do you use uh, Comixology? Do you what do you use for that? I, right now, I use one called Comic View. Yeah, I was using another one. Uh, I forgot the name of it, but uh, Marvel has a really uh, great app. Actually, it's it's a com it's a version of Comixology that's a yeah, yeah. flat fee I, subscription. I was, if you're a Marvel guy, it's uh, I was I was on Comixology for a while because yeah. I was I had the subscriptions. Right. Um, but I, I really have a lot of back like backup files of comic books that I want to put onto a tablet. <laughs> oh, interesting. So you want to scan them or take a picture of them and then put them on a tablet. Yeah. So, But but then again, like I said, my main issue is I can't really afford a $400 or $500 no, I don't blame you. A tablet. So I'm looking for something that's 250 or less, maybe 300 maybe max budget. I would, I would, I would keep an eye on sales because you can get an iPad for 300 Oh, okay. And it's it's so, faster than your Air 2. Okay. It's very much like your Air 2, but it's a little bit faster. And uh, honestly, it's there's nothing that even comes close. Yeah, of course. <laughs> of course. There are Android tablets out there. Samsung makes them and stuff. But, but frankly, anything that's good is going to cost the same as an iPad. Yeah. And, and so, so what I... What are your thoughts on like a Kindle 8, a Fire Tablet? Fire those tablet. are the cheapest... Because they're essentially subsidized by Amazon, right? Um, yeah. And they're not bad. I mean, for what you just described, they might be fine. They come with their own browser, the Fire browser, which is based on Chrome. Uh, it's Android, but it's highly customized. And so... Uh, my, my only concern with that one is I've seen their capacity is not that high. Yeah, and the screens are not that good. Um, 
Knox Harrington in our chat room has gone to Apple's refurbished site, and you can get a 32 gigabyte fifth generation iPad refurbished, which is basically the same as new when you get it from the manufacturer like this for 239 bucks. I oh, okay. I don't think there's anything comes close at even twice the price. So look, go to apple.com and go to their certified refurbished. In most cases, those aren't even used. Those are because the, the California law prohibits them from selling an iPad that's been taken home by a customer, opened, and then returned as new. Yeah. That's mostly what they are. Somebody bought it, said, no, no, I want a 64 gig, or no, I don't like this, and brought it back, never used it. Apple gives you the same warranty. It's as good as new. Usually, Apple's refurb prices are not um, not much lower, but in this case, I'm looking at a 32 gigabyte, which is not a huge amount of space, but probably adequate for $239. You're not going to get anything that good in, in, in Android. Android just not as good for a tablet. Uh, uh, another quick question, if I could. Sure. Um, um, same issue. I, I, I have an LG phone and it doesn't compare to Apple, of course. Um, I'm looking to get a refurbished uh, iPhone. Maybe I had a 6S. I was happy with my 6S, but I'm also I also saw I could get a refurbished 7 for about fifty dollars or more. Yeah, my mom will not give up her 6S. She calls it her beloved. Because <laughs> it has a headphone jack, she just really likes it. And uh, what yeah. she did was she got the battery uh, upgrade for thirty bucks that when Apple offered that, and it's as good as new from her point of view. I don't, yeah, seven. You know, every step up is going to be a little faster. Camera's going to be a little better. Screen's going to be maybe a little bit better. Uh, if you like your 6s uh, and they and you can get a refurb Apple 6s again, refurbs from Apple, fine. Refurbs from eBay, not so good. How about refurbs from Amazon? Yeah, be, you get really buyer beware. I don't want to get want you get stuck in a situation where you're buying somebody else's problems. Oh, okay. So if you get it from Apple, they put a new battery in. They give you a full warranty. Um, you know, they they check it. In most cases, it's it is new, but even if it's not. Um, it's as good as, and, and while, yeah, it's not as good a deal, you're just not buying somebody else's problems. Okay. So I, I would say, and if, if that's the difference, get a success. That's fine. Okay, cool. Yeah, check their refurbished site. I, I don't have a direct link to it. I think it's apple.com slash shop slash refurbished. Mm -hmm. But I have no hesitation recommending anything from there. Apple's very good with their refurb stuff. They may not have a 6S. That's the only... Let me just check and see what the least expensive uh, phone they have. It's a 7 Plus 479. Yeah, I'm yeah. seeing that. Yeah, they're not cheap. Um, and yeah, that's and that's the problem. I'd be really careful. I mean, you, like, you know, like I said, I was, I'm disabled and I could no longer upgrade and then I had to give my phone back to Sprint. <laughs> Son of a gun. I'm sorry about that. <sighs> Um, yeah, um, if you could conceivably get it on Amazon or eBay, or, you know, one of our sponsors, Gazelle, sells refurbished uh, iPhones, and I, they're pretty good about that. They sell yeah. on eBay. Well, yeah, I was looking at Amazon because they offer their... As long as they protect you, that's my concern. So if you have a no-questions-asked return policy, take a chance. Why not? Leo Laporte, the tech guy. We're not going to take it anymore. 80. I would get actually I was going to give you the phone number there's no point we are on our last segment of the day of the weekend of this Easter Sunday I do remind you though that the website is available seven days a week 24 7 just go to techguylabs.com we put audio and video of all the shows there after the show's over it takes a little while but you know a day or two after the show's over so you can go back through all 1585 episodes if you want we put all the questions, all the answers, uh, and there's comments, uh, so you can leave a thought if you're if you're listening to the show and you say I got a better idea or how about this. That's also very welcome, and uh, none of this costs anything. There's no sign up. TechGuyLabs.com. 
there are no trackers on the site. I don't, I don't think so, anyway. Uh, TechGuyLabs.com. Let me put that there for your convenience. We don't uh, charge you to use it. There's also a nice search, so you can search through it and find previous questions and answers. Gary in Chicktawaga, New York. Hello, Gary. Hey, Leo. Waiting. Uh, just getting ready here to go with my pre-Dingus Day celebration. Pre what, is what is it? What is, what is it? Pre-Dingus Day? Yeah, Dingus Day. It's the day after Easter, uh, kind of like Polish Mardi Gras. Oh, I didn't know about that. Oh, yeah, you got to come to Buffalo. <clears throat> uh, it's yeah. a Polish holiday. Wow. Schmigos yeah, Dingus. Yeah, you eat eat pierogi, drink beer, eat gumki, drink beer. I think you should eat pierogi, drink beer every day of the year. <laughs> That's my favorite. That's how fun. Well, I hope you have a great Dingus Day. Yeah, there's a pre-celebration tonight. Wait a minute. Oh, Traditionally, the... boys throw water over girls and spank them with pussy willow branches? Younger boys do that. <laughs> <laughs> what? Oh, in some regions, boys dress up as bears. Wow. Yeah, it gets pretty wild. It goes back to 1000 AD. Interesting. All right. Well, have a great dingus day. Uh, are you going to dress up as a bear? No. Oh, good. I'm just going to drink some beer. <laughs> good. <laughs> but while I, I called to ask you about this plan, system, but while I was waiting, I got an email from... Google Voice, uh, my G Suite account, they're offering me to pay 10 bucks a month for Google Voice. Such uh, a deal. Not... Such a deal. Yeah, I, I guess I can keep it free if I want, but apparently if new G Suite customers are going to have to pay for it if they want it. <sighs> you know, G Suite isn't free. G Suite is a business offering. Yeah, no, I know. I have, it, I have it so I can use my private domain name for my Gmail. Perfect. Account. I like that. Right. Yeah, we do that uh, in the company, too. Um, you know, we have mail.twit.tv is, is actually Gmail and all of that. And I think for, it makes a lot of sense for companies. Um, yeah. what, do they, what do you get for paying 10 bucks? I mean, you get anything extra? No. It, well, you get, it doesn't look like for the basic one you don't get anything extra. For the, the next step up for 20 bucks a month, you get uh, e-discovery services. You, you, must, you must also get some uh, voice call credits, right? Because... Outbound, you can use Google Voice as a as for business as a phone PBX, really. Oh yeah, it says unlimited calling to the U.S., unlimited SMS, voicemail huh. transcription, but uh, Google Calendar integration, Hangouts Meet integration. Yeah. So what they're uh, doing, and we talked about this yesterday, is they're replacing Hangouts with two new apps, Meet and Chat. Meet will have the the video and voice calling. Chat will have the text messaging. I don't like what Google's doing, but I, uh, in a way, I'm glad because if they can make money on Google Voice, maybe they won't get rid of it. Um, yeah. Because I use the free vo Google Voice, and I, I d literally depend on it. It's become, it's uh, you know, because I became a Google Fi subscriber, it became my Fi phone number. So I think probably they'll keep that going. I don't know uh, what you get for it. Do you have to do it? No, it said it said you can, it said current... G Suite customers who have already signed up for Google Voice can just keep the free Google Voice. Yeah. So it sounds to me like if you become a G Suite it's customer... It's new users. You're, yeah. You're pay for Google Voice if you want Google yeah. Voice on that account. I guess you could always just do a different well, account. And, in a way, that kind of makes sense since, after all, uh, you know, there are a lot of commercial services that are similar to Google Voice that aren't free. I mean, it's been a great free product for years. Think of what we get with Google Voice. So. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I don't use it extensively, but I have a couple of them. But before I paid, like, before I paid ten bucks a month, I would look around and see what else you could get. Uh, there are lots of companies that offer this kind of business voice over the internet. There's Grasshopper. There's uh, what we use at work, actually, um, which I and I can't remember the name of it. Uh, there's Mighty Call, Nextiva, Dingtone. Telzio, Freedom, I can go on and on, Line 2. Yeah. There's quite a few. We use Ring Central. I'm sorry, I forgot your name, Ring Central. I, um, I use Ring Central for my facts. Yeah. And so you can you can do all the things and plus, you know, a lot more that Google Voice does. So I would check before paying for Google Voice to make sure that it's the best deal out there. And remember, you can port your number. Oh, yeah. I've done that back and forth. I tried, I tried five for a while and went back and forth. Yeah, it took yeah. a while, though, for them to move the number back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's because the telco 
hung on to it, right? No, no. The, the, what happened was I, I moved it really quickly to Google Voice, and then when I tried Phi, they moved that number, of course, to Phi. And then when I said I don't want Phi anymore, it took them a couple of months to move that number back to a Google Voice number. Interesting. Uh, where oh, I that's left weird. It, it was just an extra number I used. That's but weird. what I had actually called you about was uh, was play on service. I, YouTube sent me an email last week telling me that my thirty five dollar a month fee is going up to fifty. <laughs> I know. I canceled. Uh, yeah. Well, I, Spectrum has a fifty dollar package here in Buffalo that gives me about one hundred twenty five channels. The only thing is they don't have as good a, a DVR service. I like to record my yeah. local news because yeah. I watch it at odd times. So you're talking about I, YouTube TV versus something like Play On, and YouTube yeah, well, TV has on apparently Go ahead. Play On apparently would let me re DVR my local stations through Spectrum. Nice. YouTube does that for me now? Yeah. YouTube TV does it. Digital DVR is great because you don't actually have a DVR. They just save it online. You can stream it at your leisure. Is that legitimate? I mean, they say they do Netflix and Hulu. Yeah, they um, absolutely. They have a deal with Spectrum. I guarantee you. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Spectrum's not going to let them. My... <laughs> no, Spectrum's not going to let them do that without a relationship. Absolutely. All right, because they got to yeah. give them the password, obviously, so they can get into the service. Oh. Well, that's interesting. They don't already know, huh? Maybe they don't have a deal. Apparently, when you sign up with Play On, you. You know, then you tell them, okay, I want to, uh, for instance, I want to record shows on Netflix. You have, they have to know your password so they can. Oh, interesting. Eh, I'm not sure I want to give my password to anybody. That's an interesting uh, feature. Yeah, well, that's why I was wondering. Yeah. It, huh. It also, it's like a $39 lifetime fee if you just want to record stuff. If you want a cloud, then it's a monthly service. I would uh, if you're going to pay fifty bucks a month. I would look at uh, I would look at YouTube TV. I, I I couldn't I couldn't swallow the increase, the fifteen dollar a month increase out of nowhere. I just couldn't swallow it, so I canceled. Yeah, that seemed like a lot to me. It's an awful lot, and there are other choices out there like PlayStation View and Sling TV. Sling TV is a lot less expensive. Many of them have similar features. That DVR feature though, Google does a great job with that. You can d each. A uh, family member, up to, I think, six, can have their own DVR. Um, the interface is the best of any of them. I mean, I, there there are a lot of reasons YouTube TV is really good. But I think that that jump, that price jump, I just wanted to send them a signal. Nope, not going to do it. I don't know about Play On. I mean, they've been around for a long time. I, I have no reason to think they're shady at all. I think they're fine. But I don't want to give anybody my passwords. That seems odd. If you know, let us know. Leo Laporte, the Tech Guy. Have a great geek week. Well, that's it for the Tech Guy show for today. Thank you so much for being here. And don't forget, TWIT, T-W-I-T. It stands for This Week in Tech, and you'll find it at twit.tv, including the podcasts for this show. We talk about Windows on Windows Weekly, Macintosh on Mac Break Weekly, iPads, iPhones, Apple Watches on iOS Today, Security and Security Now. I mean, I can go on and on and on. And, of course, the big show every Sunday afternoon, this Week in Tech. You'll find it all at twit.tv. And I'll be back next week with another great Tech Guys show. Thanks for joining me. We'll see you next time.